th there's been a lot of uh, um, fear generated around this topic, saying the EU is trying to outlaw open source. Like, this is nonsense. And welcome to another episode of the Accelerometer. I'm Dr. Matthew Merman, CEO and founder of Anarchy. Today we're going to be discussing AI legislation with Kevin Shavinsky, founder and CEO of Modulos, an AI governance platform. Now, AI legislation has been in the news a lot lately, so I'm really excited to be talking to an expert on this topic. Kevin comes to us with a fairly unusual background, having previously been a physics professor at ETH. I'm really curious to hear how he made that jump and a little bit more about what Modulus does. Kevin, do you think you can tell us a little bit more about your work? Yeah, sure. Um, so we're at a threshold in how AI practitioners and data scientists and all the software practitioners that work on AI are going to be putting their products and services together. And it's forced not by innovation in technology, it's going to be forced by government regulation. So the EU has been working on something called the EU AI Act, the Artificial Intelligence Act, since about 2018. And this was more or less ignored by people for a long time. Um, it was being developed by the Commission, by uh, the various bodies of the EU. And it came to the forefront in a rather dramatic way when the wave of uh, ChatGPT and innovation from that hit. And of course, governments got very interested in the business of regulating AI. And so now the AI Act is close to a political deal. So whatever I say in this podcast, um, by the time you see this, may no longer be accurate because the horse trading, the private, uh, non-public horse trading is happening right now. And... So whatever I say, you know, caveat emptor. So tell me a little bit about how you got into your work on AI governance. So we, we founded Modulus um, a couple of years ago with a focus on data-centric AI as a technology. So we had all these really cool tools to help you identify specific, uh, on a sample-by-sample -sample level, those sources of error, noise, and bias that would cause problems in the performance of your model. So you could uh, easily debug your data to find the samples that would hurt your, your accuracy or some other performance metric. But they could also tell you where a source of particular bias came from. So it could help you uh, de-bias both your data set and the resulting model that you trained on it. And almost two years ago now, we did a SWOT analysis uh, as an exercise to see where, where we are. And one of the threats that uh, we came up with is, well, what happens if the EU does regulate AI? And we did our research, and actually, they were working on it. And as I said earlier, it was very much unknown. We read that draft act as it was at the time, and we realized this will change so many aspects of how AI is used by, by, by companies and how it's served to, to the public, that there needed to be a tooling and infrastructure around building AI in an actually completely different way, in a way that's maybe not so natural to most um, developers. So how exactly, what sort of tooling are you building around AI to prepare for this act? So I, I'll, I'll do it maybe a little bit by uh, analogy. So uh, a type of regulatory compliance and standards compliance that, that most developers will be familiar with is information security and uh, management systems. So if you want to get SOC 2 certified or ISO 27001 certified, you have to build certain systems around your information security, um, test them and maintain them. You have to build the policies around them. And this used to be essentially a manual exercise, right? You'd have an Excel sheet with the controls that you needed to fulfill so that when the auditor came, you got your certification. Now, a whole bunch of companies built amazing software products around that to help you with that. These are the uh, Vanta, Drata, others. They build really good uh, software products that also automate most of the process that goes into building information security. Another analogy, and this is maybe closer to what the AI Act will do, are those people involved in building highly regulated systems. So probably the most prominent one would be medical devices, but things to do with aviation, security, uh, safety, those are in many cases already highly regulated and must meet certain standards. And those standards include methodologies for managing quality and managing risk. And the EU has basically taken that approach 
um, not not directly, but but heavily inspired, especially the medical device regulation, and wrote an AI act that makes building high risk AI, AI applications into an exercise similar to building a medical device. Given that there are these new regulations that make it so that there's a lot of extra work that you have to do to release an AI for a high risk application. How do you think that uh, prospective PhD students, researchers can prepare to be building their own projects in AI? So um, pure research purposes, of course, are, are not touched by the AI Act because you're not putting products on the market, right? If you, if you just build them, there's been a lot of uh, um, fear generated around this topic saying the EU is trying to outlaw open source. Like, this is nonsense. Um, you can build open source, you can do research, you can do whatever you want. The AI Act starts to apply when you create a product out of it that you want to put to market. And so again, the analysis would be if you're a student in, you know, building new therapies for uh, people, uh, new devices to help people, if you do them in the lab at the university, of course there are certain protocols to obey, but it's not the same as saying, okay, now I want to sell this to patients, right? And so if you're a student today, if you're thinking about working in high-risk AI applications, you should be aware of what's in the AI Act and also actually other laws and regulations that other countries are working on. Get familiar with that way of working um, so that when you go into the private sector, you, you know what you're facing. But don't let it slow down your research work. What in this case counts as a product? <laughs> there we, we, uh, I, I preface this with saying I am not a lawyer. I'm, I'm not giving you legal advice. But if you're putting it on the market, that is, you're, you're, you're selling it as a service or you're offering it as a service, that is on the market. Um, but it doesn't have to be necessarily a consumer-facing product, though that's often going to be the case. Um, but there are also applications that deal, especially with health and safety, where the AI component may be something that you as an individual would never see, um, but uh, let me think of an example here. Um, one thing that's explicitly name-checked, if there's an emergency dispatch system, you, you call your emergency number, and the system that prioritizes you know, who gets the, the, the uh, police car or the ambulance first, that might be powered by an AI system. That is for sure high risk, but you would never see it. It's still on the market. So you seem a little bit excited about this sort of regulation. Uh, is that an accurate statement? I th excited is the wrong word. I think it's going to be a sea change in, in how we deal with this really cool technology. And the sooner we get ready for it, I think the better it will be and the easier it will be. And I'll, 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 again, I, I, I love analogies because it's really the only thing we have here because we don't really know what's coming. So in 2016, the EU introduced GDPR. And we all know GDPR is the annoying thing where you have to click away the cookie banner. But of course, that's not what GDPR is. It's, it's actually not even in GDPR. Cookie banners are not in there. Um, GDPR is all about how personal data, private data, is supposed to be handled. And so when GDPR was introduced, the challenge was, the engineering challenge was, to essentially rebuild the data infrastructure of almost all companies, and almost all companies, not just in Europe, but around the world. So we looked into this, and... Uh, the GDPR introduction had a two-year transition period, so from when it was uh, passed until the penalty started. Um, it was a two-year period, and nobody really knows for sure how much money was spent by private industry to get ready for that moment. Um, but the study from the European Commission itself puts the number around 200 billion euros. So that's the scale. That's the only comparison we have to the scale of the engineering challenge that the AI community has starting probably in a few months. Do you think that these regulations go far enough? That's a, a very leading question. So um, in order to, to, to tackle that question, le let's talk about what the EU is actually intending with it. And what they're intending is consumer protection. So they care about making sure that AI-based products are safe, respect people's rights. And if you, if you want to dig really deep, ultimately, it addresses the concern that people have. Like, if you look at surveys today, are, are people excited about AI? Some people are. Uh, people in, in the tech space are. But most people are actually rather concerned about AI, the effect it will have on our lives, on our economic opportunities, our jobs in the future, 
about discrimination, about um, being sorted by AI and, and losing opportunities in lives. And so the EU takes a position, okay, we're going to introduce a safety regime here that is similar to what we have for other types of products. So um, when you buy a car today, it is required to have certain safety features. It has to have an airbag. It has to have compression zones. It has to be able to roll over and protect you and, and all these things. And so when you buy a car, you don't really think too deeply about, well, will this car kill me? You just assume that the government forced the car companies to make it safe. And that is a little bit the approach the AI Act takes. Um, that's also the basis behind their risk-based approach, which is really a core component of the Act, which says that how regulated the AI application is depends on what the application is. So what are you doing with it? Um, and we can talk about that because it's actually very fuzzily defined. Um, but that's what they're addressing. So if we're saying, well, it's consumer protection, it's uh, uh, product safety, if you want to put it like that, it, it makes sense. And I think we can all be behind it. And then we can immediately question, well, does it achieve its purpose? Does it achieve the goals it set itself? And that I can't answer because the negotiations aren't even finished. And we don't know how products and services will change once it's introduced. So we'll have to wait and see if it really does achieve what it sets out to do. What sort of regulations would you be looking for? I have some favorite aspects to the, the AI Act that I think are really, really good. I'll give you uh, one or two examples. So um, the AI Act is very concerned with making sure that fundamental rights are respected and that you're not discriminated against by AI. And there's a really nice provision in there that says that if you know that your AI application is at risk of discriminating against a certain group, certain really stringent conditions hold, you can weaken certain other provisions in data protection in order to get good training data to make sure your application doesn't discriminate or you minimize the discrimination. I, I think that's really well thought out and it's a good thing. A second example that I think is really, really good is it asks you to be mindful of feedback loops. So what do we mean by that? The act says, worry about having even small levels of discrimination that can accumulate, and then worst case, even affect your training data and have a negative feedback loop. So even though maybe your gender bias is only like a fraction of a percent, if it's something that happens again and again and again, you might set up a negative feedback loop without even realizing it, that will lead to massive discrimination long-term. So you should think about that and think about how to mitigate it. And I, I really like that. So you mentioned before that the public was worried about AI. And is that something that you're worried about? Yeah. I mean, if you think about how ubiquitous and powerful these systems are, and in most places people don't even know that they're there, um, and what power they have over our, our, our lives, yeah, I would like there to be some some standards to comply to, some some disclosure on what these systems are really doing and how they work. What's your personal nightmare scenario? Well, I, I think the nightmare scenarios are very mundane where these systems go unchecked, you know, the the things that, um, that we hold dear, our fundamental rights, equality, equal access, democracy, rule of law, elections, that these things are affected by these powerful systems without any recourse or disclosure or oversight. And regulatory regimes like the, the AI Act, they, they at least point in the right direction to, to mitigate that. In what places do we have these systems that we're not really aware of? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very personal question because I think it really depends on, on how much you know about where AI really is. And probably uh, the people listening to us are, are fairly aware of how ubiquitous it is. But I think most people are not aware that if they apply for health insurance, that AI might be used to assess whether they should get coverage. Is that really the same type of AI, though, that this act is aiming at covering? Because we've had this sort of machine learning and like analysis of insurance for at least like 30. I mean, it, depending on what you consider machine learning, like we've had that since the beginning of the concept of insurance. Uh, isn't the act mostly meant to cover the recent advances around language modeling? So it wasn't originally. It was originally got meant for the sort of traditional machine learning all the way down to logistic regression in Excel. Um, and then when ChatGPT happened, there's a last-minute effort to, to bring these things in the act. And I know 
uh, today as we're recording this, there are massive negotiations, new proposals on how to categorize the different levels of large language models, foundation models, generative AI. Defining these terms in law is actually very, very difficult, and they're trying to do it in record time. Um, but the, the act takes a, a very uh, interesting approach here. It basically says... It doesn't matter really what's in it as long as it's a, a type of machine, a system that learns from and uses data, then it's uh, covered, then it's AI. And what matters is what you use it for. So if you're using ChatGPT to uh, give you a, a recipe based on what you have in, in the fridge, nobody cares about that, right? That doesn't need to be uh, too, uh, uh, too much scrutiny on it. If you're using ChatGPT to complete your employees' performance evaluations, as I've heard from some companies that, that were experimenting with those tools, you, you know, suddenly you have a high-risk system because now you have uh, uh, this incredibly complicated modern thing, uh, an, an LLM, making decisions on your future chances. So really in this case, like it sounds a little bit like this act is almost a GDPR 2.0, less than something novel about machine learning if it's just about data usage. Uh, yeah, I think GDPR in in scope and also penalties and and an approach is is very similar. And there's of course also the political aspect to it, which is that Brussels very much saw GDPR as part of their goal, their ambition to be the global regulator, the Brussels effect. If you if you've uh, heard the term, where Brussels sets the rules for the world because they're the largest market. Uh, the EU is the largest market. And if you're building, you might as well build to that standard. So the EU is very conscious of that. They did it for data and privacy. Uh, America um, at the time didn't really react to it. So there's no federal law competing with GDPR. And so now, if you're a business also in the US, you care, you worry about GDPR. And the EU wants the same thing with uh, uh, the AI Act. They want to transmit European norms and European values globally and say, if you're building AI, you're building to our standards. What's something in, about the future of AI that you're particularly optimistic about? I think the the number of use cases and, and the things that you can do with it. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking these super, super uh, superlatives, like I, I don't even want to list them. The opportunity is so huge. We just need to make sure that those applications have some degree of oversight, regulation, and safety so that they don't do... And I'm not talking about the sort of extinction, doom, whatever discussion. I'm talking about really mundane, everyday effects that those are thought about deeply and carefully by the people who build them, that we don't just rush out because it's cool, but that we think about that we have a process for building things that are safe. So to go back to the old car analogy, yeah, we can build cars that are really cool and really fast, but what people want is a car that doesn't kill them. So what's something that you wish startups were doing more of right now? I've seen a lot of concerns from startups about how regulation basically will, will kill their business and uh, will it just benefits the incumbents, you know, the Googles and the Metas of the world, they, they, they will adapt to any regulatory regime and actually uh, use it uh, to their advantage. Um, I would say if you're building an AI application today, and you think you might be anywhere near that high-risk list, you know, start building with those principles in mind even today, even maybe before for the, the act as law, um, and, and take it seriously, and your customers will thank you for it, and your market access will be much easier. So again, uh, to go back to the security certificates, if you're, if you're a SaaS startup today, right, you, you want to have that SOC 2 certification. Right, because you're, if you're B two B, because your your uh, your customers will demand it, and the same thing will be true for the AI aspect. They will ask you, you know, are you AI Act compliant? You know, are you, have you been assessed? Do you have a certification? And if you can say, yeah, in fact, we thought about this right from the beginning, you're going to have an edge over your competitors who didn't do that. I know that you were previously uh, an astrophysicist. You were a professor at ETH, sure, uh, and like. That must have been an incredible jump to get into startups after that. Yeah, well, I've, I've always done sort of ma maybe slightly unusual things, um, even as an astrophysicist. So, so my, my, my research topic was the coevolution of galaxies and supermassive black holes. And to do that, I basically 
studied data from large surveys and uh, surveys being basically data recorded by telescopes, whether they be on the ground or in space. Sometimes I even went to the telescopes. Sometimes I worked with the instruments, but mostly it was um, what we now call, would call like data analytics. Um, and so when I was a PhD student, I had my first run in with AI because um, I wanted to get large numbers of galaxies of different shapes. So there's fundamentally two types of galaxies. There's spiral galaxies like the Milky Way, the sort of the swirly things, and there are elliptical or early type galaxies that look like a football or a, or a rugby ball. And, and we don't really understand how one turns into the other. Uh, and so I was working on that for my PhD. And so I tried to get more of the particular type of galaxies, the early type galaxies. And actually I looked into methods for sorting through the data and actually the, the sort of computer vision, machine learning type tools that were available at the time, I, I tried some of them and they basically, they were just weren't good enough. So I said, all right, I'm going to sit down for a week, go through 50,000 images and do it myself until I got a blinding headache. And then one uh, evening uh, on Friday in the pub, I was talking to a colleague about this. And so we said, why don't we take all the, like there's a million images that we could sort through. Why don't we put them on a website and see if there's like a bunch of people out there that would want to help us. And this kind of blew up. So we built this website um, called Galaxy Zoo, put the, the uh, Galaxy images there. And when we launched, we were the second most emailed uh, or the second most viewed story on BBC, BBC News. Um, number one was man, uh, man flies to wedding a year early. You cannot beat that. And then the day after we're beaten by a uh, huge dog is reluctant media star. Um, so again, you cannot beat that. But we, we were so wildly successful that the server we were accessing that the astronomers in the U.S. had put the data, it actually physically melted, like a cable melted, like it's not a figure of speech. Um, because by the time we were done, we had hundreds of thousands of people <laughs> clicking away on galaxies at rates that we never imagined. So we sort of put two and two together because colleagues from other areas of science started emailing us like, can I, can I give you my data and have people sort through it? So you started this thing called the Zooniverse, which ended up in the end with like, I don't know, over two million, two and a half million users. Um, clicking away at images. We would now call them like uh, labelers. Um, uh, we didn't think of them as labelers for AI at the time. We thought of them as the actual device with which to classify the data. And they're really good at that. It's actually still going on. Um, I then went to the US for a bit, um, got really heavily also into X-ray astronomy, um, looking at distant supermassive black holes with uh, very high energy photons. Uh, it's also a very, very different way of looking at things because you literally... Um, count the individual photons. Like there's one, there's a second one, you know, over a couple of weeks. Uh, very different regime, very, very fun. Um, I came back home to Switzerland at ETH and this was like 2012 and very quickly actually got really, I don't know, uh, unmotivated in working on galaxy evolution and, and black holes because we just were making no progress. And so I basically said, all right, I see that machine learning's come a long way um, why don't we use that for science? And so I actually got more interested in using machine learning than the science enabled itself. And we had lots of cool projects. And so when I met my co-founder, who's a computer science professor at ETH, he now moved to the University of Chicago. And we decided to start a startup, um, first focusing actually on data-centric AI, uh, which was uh, very new at the time, which is really all about giving, giving you the tools to iterate between model and data and finding the source of error noise and bias in the data. So basically saying, hey, which, which, which small number of samples in my data are ruining my, the accuracy of my model, or even more interesting, and then you see the, the connection to the AI act and what's coming now, which samples in my data are responsible for the bias in the model? Where, 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 where does the bias really come from? And so you develop really cool tools for that, and uh, that's how we ended up, but then one day discovering the AI act. So I presume you're no longer a professor. Mm. How has it felt transitioning? I mean, you just do it. You don't look back, and um, you 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 <laughs> make the decisions that you think make the most sense. And I think there's no better place to be right now than working on AI. And there's so many cool things happening so fast. It's impossible to keep up, and and I'm just super excited about being part of that world. There's actually a, a little return, um, though I'm sort of only very marginally involved. So I'm part of a group of astronomers uh, using LLMs for astronomy research, and one of the things we did is we actually f um, did a fine-tuned uh, llama on astronomy data, and it's actually able to answer astronomy questions 
um, pretty well, I would say, at the level of maybe like a good master's student or early PhD student. So it's, it's, it's pretty good. And we see this as a foundation of all sorts of cool um, applications for essentially using, using LLMs um, for science. And I think um, astronomy is a perfect place to do it um, because there's only two places where you have full access to all the data. Either you are Google or Meta or whatever, and you own all the data in the world, so you can build really cool things there. Or you go to science, and there's really only one science where all the data are public, and that's astronomy. And the reason for that is because most data is taken by um, government-funded facilities. So by law in the U.S., all data taken by Hubble are public. There's no copyright, there's no restriction, there's no license. And so it's all the knowledge, all the data in astronomy is, is actually available, and so you can build with that. You mentioned uh, that your llama model can answer astronomy questions. Can you give us an example of like what one of these questions might be? Um, so it's tuned on the research abstracts of uh, scientific papers. So you can ask it, um, for example, what, what, what do we know about the metallicity distribution of outer halo stars in the Milky Way and what it means for, uh, for Milky Way assembly? So really nerdy, technical astronomy questions. Are you always asking it questions that you know the answer to, or have you ever asked it to solve something that, like, unexpected? I, I, I think I, I will let the uh, other members of our team uh, speak to that. It's, it, it's actually also dangerous for me because, I mean, I've, I've left astronomy four or five years ago, so I'm, I'm, I wouldn't claim to be up to date. But even, like, even like known problems, like, you know, uh, early on people discovered that... Uh, GPT four wasn't or GPT three point five wasn't particularly good at math. It couldn't like add two numbers together after a certain uh, like size. So have you tried giving it like simple like inductive problems? Um, I haven't. Uh, what I noticed that that it's actually good at is um, r motivating well why it knows things like what what the data behind it is. Um, that maybe sounds more impressive than it is, but it would say identify the right instrument or survey or, or, or campaign that produced certain results. It, it seemed to be pretty good at that for me. What's been the biggest transition for you coming from academia going into startups? Academia is far more zero sum than startups. So in academia, if, if I write the paper, you can't. If you get the prize, I can't. There's a limited supply of these things. And so there's always, even with your best friends and colleagues, there's a, there's a, there's an, absolute competition and in startups there isn't right like if 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 i discover tomorrow there's another ai governance startup focusing on the AI act i say whoa that's cool that's validation that our idea, idea is good the market is big Let, let's uh, let's both go for it like I, I would actually feel positive about that so in your startup journey have there been any uh have there been any bumps since you started i mean of course startups are hard if they were easy everyone would do it right um no, it's, I think the biggest decision we took, and it was a calculated risk, was moving away from data-centric AI and saying, okay, we focus on governance, regulation, and compliance, which to me was a new topic I had to get educated on. Um, and it was a gamble because we didn't know when was the law going to come, what was really going to be in it, was it really going to be something that, that's going to be, be a big, big deal? And we took a calculated bet, and we, we were really amongst the first people building towards that. Um, and, and now, I mean, it's gratifying to see now, now we're starting to have competitors. How do you think about, uh, building a culture for your company? So a culture has two components. It's, it's something that you as uh, a founder or co-founder can bring in, but there's also, if you build a good team, you have, uh, people with strong opinions that are opinionated about how things should be. And you need to harness that and you need to guide that and you make sure everyone's moving in, in the same direction. And that's a continual challenge. And there, there, there are tools for that. There, there, there are methods for, for, for finding that alignment. But I think that's really important that um, people who are thoughtful and people who have strong opinions and things are, aren't ignored and, and are able to contribute to uh, the culture you want to build as a team. And I don't think there's one correct way to do it. Uh, I think there's very different ways. And it, it depends maybe also on your core team what works for you. And so one, one of the big debates that people are having right now is um, work from home, work remote. Do you come in the office? Do you work only in the office? 
And people have very strong opinions on that. And um, I actually talked to our, our people about how they feel they work best. And we, we looked at that and, and we found our solution, our sweet spot for that. I think we're out of time, but thank you so much for coming on. It was really wonderful. Thank you very much.